so we're up here in the in the Barrow Vineyard, which is the newest addition to uh, the Bloomer Creek portfolio, I guess. And you know, sort of looking around, obviously there's no there are no vines here yet. This is a brand new project to you. Um, tell us a little bit about it. What's special about this site? What what drew you here? And you know, what what are your plans for this area? Well, we're. Uh, planning on planting four acres of Riesling this spring, and we have 12 acres total. We'll probably plant the whole thing to Riesling. This is a beautiful site. It's very thin soil. Uh, it's perfect Riesling soil from what I'm told. Uh, and we're going to plant uh, two different clones uh, by the end of next week, which is an ambitious goal, but I think we can do it. So we're in Sawmill Creek uh, Vineyard, which you know, is you know arguably not only a, a very beautiful site, uh, but certainly I think you know produces some really compelling wines. Uh, I guess right off the bat, what's what's special about this site? What's unique about it? Uh, I mean, probably one of the first things you're noticing is just the slope of this site. It's one of the most uh, perhaps breathtaking when you first drive into it. You wouldn't notice it from the road, and then you'd kind of start driving down the road to Sawmill Creek, and you just have these the steep drop off right to the lake. Uh, the property actually ends at the lake. You're going right down to the water. Uh, beautiful air drainage. And then it's really kind of this classic banana belt. Uh, we're facing towards the setting sun right now. We're facing west. And especially as we get into June here in July with the late evening sun, uh, these vines are getting uh, sun exposure until nine o'clock at night. Just kind of, they're not baking. They're not turning into raisins by any means, but they're really, you know, really just soaking up the sun's rays. So you mentioned banana belt, and it's a term that's kind of thrown around. Um, I guess it refers to this specific area. Can you give me a little bit of background on, on what that reference is? And sure. where, we're, where exactly we are when we talk about that? Uh, banana belt uh, is a reference to the southeast side of Seneca Lake. Uh, the It's kind of a funny thing. To, when I first heard it, when I was first in the industry, I thought it was because of the shape. Mm -hmm. They were talking about kind of the curl around the lake at that point, which might be part of it. But the, the real idea behind it is that sun exposure and how warm it gets here. Uh, usually a couple degrees warmer uh, on this side of the lake. It tends to do a little bit better in cooler vintages because of that. Uh, and then that late sun really kind of helps everything ripen up. You know, Riesling obviously, you know, is a varietal that, you know, thrives on mineral driven soils and soils that can sort of impart a specific character. Um, can you speak a little bit more about the soil here and, you know, maybe what's special about some of the other sites that you've seen in the area? Well, this site is very different from our farm in Ovid. Uh, this, soil, this soil here is very thin. It, the topsoil ranges from, I'll say, two to four feet deep. And underneath that, it's a mixture of layers of shale. And then there's also crumbly shale mixed with clay. But it tends to be very poor and shallow soil compared to the fertile farmland that we have up in Ovid, which is very high lime, fertile soil. Uh, it seems counterintuitive, I believe you have said, uh, that we would be making good Riesling wine from that site as well. Uh, but we have high hopes for this site, uh, you know, maybe. Well, in part because of all the extra work that you do to combat the, the fertility of the, right. the other soil. Right. So there, this might be a whole different Whole ball game. Right, maybe it'll be easy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking at the soil here and there's a ton of stones here. Um, you were, we were sort of talking about this a little bit earlier, it's a very shale rich site. Um, mm -hmm. So is that f for the most part consistent throughout the entire vineyard? Do you have different uh, specific terroir in different spots mm -hmm. of the vineyard that you have planted here? Well we have to jump back that uh, this whole area is created by glaciers and when a glacier comes through and recedes and comes back again, it grinds soils up, stones up. It also will uh, grab soils and ground up into the, the glaciers themselves and they'll move them quite a ways mm -hmm. and then deposit them again. So you have to, when you deal with soils in the Finger Lakes, you have to understand that it can change three or four times down that row. Yep. And we have to make some adjustments for that. Um, and as far as the stones go, I spent my childhood picking them up out of here. I think my father's favorite thing was, let's go pick up stone. And uh, these are what's left after weeks and weeks of picking up stone. Uh, but yes, we are uh, kind of loamy soils, a lot of clays and a lot of gravels. Uh, but uh, it's something you always have to give consideration when you, when you plant a vine uh, vineyard and how you orient it, and especially when you're prepping a, a vineyard site. So we're on the west side of Cuca Lake, 
um, at Dr. Constantine Pronk Vinifera Cellars, which is obviously a very historic site. Um, can you give us a little bit of background about the winery itself and Dr. Frank and sort of the, the history of vinifera in the U.S. and I guess here in New York State? These are some of the oldest vines now in the entire United States. Uh, back in the 1950s when Dr. Constantine Frank first planted the vinifera in New York State, um, he had to overcome a, an obstacle and the obstacle was an insect living in the soil called phylloxera. It's, a, it's also a root louse. And this insect was native to the whole eastern United States and is part of the reason why it took so long for vinifera or European wine grapes to get established here in New York State. But because uh, Constantine did his PhD in viticulture and his thesis was techniques for growing vinifera in a cold climate. So when he came to New York State and he was told by the industry experts that you couldn't grow vinifera here, he took that as a challenge and uh, set out to prove them wrong and uh, he was successful. And one of the keys to his success was grafting the vines onto resistant rootstock, namely Vitis Labrusca. And what you see here, this is a, an example of a grafted vine, and this bulge in the middle is where the scion, the European portion, is above the bulge, and the native or the wild vine is below the bulge. And so this was a natural approach without using dangerous pesticides to kill this root louse, this was a natural approach to grow the vinifera uh, in the Finger Lakes and overcome the obstacle of phylloxera. So coming back to the, the actual growth and development of the vine, so what are the next steps um, as far as bud break is here? I mean, what can you take us through the next couple of months and the development of the vine and then the grapes leading up to harvest? One of the things that we're gonna get into pretty soon is shoot thinning and just kind of uh, reducing the number of shoots and, and opening things up to, it helps uh, prevent shading. It also helps with disease management and then also spray programs and things like that to prevent disease. Uh, then we'll be getting into shoot positioning and actually training the vines to, to uh, increase photosynthetic activity and such. Yeah, maybe suckering. Uh, probably choosing renewals for, for next year. Mm -hmm. um, we have to hill the vines up to protect the graft union. That's that mound of dirt you see in there. That'll eventually come down as well. Mm -hmm. There's no... Weed management. You know, constantly doing something. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, early 2013. Mm -hmm. You're looking at, we're looking at a, a Riesling block that you have planted here on the west side of Seneca. So. Um, obviously, we're starting to see some leaves on the vines. What's going on in the vines right now? What's happening right now as we're sort of starting up the season? Well, we have just uh, basically had bud break, and we're getting the first couple inches of growth. Uh, if you look closely, we can see uh, some clusters starting to form, and that's going to give us an idea of what uh, our crop is going to be like uh, come this fall. It's We're sort of in the springtime now. What is it that you're looking for when you're coming to these vines, especially with younger vines? I mean, are there things that you're especially concerned about, whether it's, aside from frost, for instance, like disease, um, is there something that you look for differently in different varietals to give you an indication that the vines are really starting to come out of dormancy in a, sure. in a comfortable way? Sure. Well, they obviously do all come out at different times, so we've got 20 different varieties of grapes on the farm, and you'll see, I mean, the early ones, as the early ones start to emerge, you get an idea of how the, the grapes in general have survived the winter mm -hmm. and what we saw this year was just a really nice bud break along the cane so sometimes you'll see a little spotty you might see buds coming out near the, the end of the cane and some in the head of the vine but this year they just broke more evenly than I can ever remember really in, in a lot of varieties so we're obviously looking for that um, on the vinifera we kind of have a heads up on that because we will uh, look at the buds during the dormant season before we do the pruning. We'll cut through the cross section of the bud and really get an idea if we have any winter kill. So if we've had any damage from a, uh, an ultimate cold in the winter, we usually know on the vinifera and we will trim them accordingly. So this year, um, not a lot of winter damage, so they, they really came through the winter beautifully. I mean, we had some, some cold temperatures, but it kind of gradually got cold. The vines acclimate and then it gradually warmed up, which is perfect. We just don't like to see a lot of uh, big temperature swings. So once the once the buds emerge and open up a little bit, they, they that's 
the susceptible phase. So if you get a frost, then uh, the primaries are the first bud that comes out and they can be frosted off. So the vine has mechanisms to deal with that. There's a secondary bud at each site and also a tertiary bud that will push out if the, the primary gets frosted off. So you can still have a live vine, but you'll have a far reduced yield on that vine. The primary is the most fruitful bud. So site is a very important thing. Um, you know, in the European model, you know, terroir, expression of a specific place is, is very important from Burgundy to Alsace to basically, you know, all the other great uh, old world wine growing regions. Do you find that that's sort of an increasingly important topic here in the Finger Lakes? And, you know, if so, what sort of expressions do you see between the different vineyards that you work with specifically? When you look at these great Riesling regions elsewhere in the world, uh, they've historically always varied vineyard by vineyard and recognize the differences between each site. So I think we're just, uh, rather than blending everything together, we're recognizing that there's really unique things in each plot of land that can be teased out with the winemaking uh, and you know really suit a particular style of wine best.